While schools for low-income and minority students that succeeded in the past often had to do so despite the indifference of boards of education run by white officials, those which have succeeded in our own time have often had to do so in the face of active hostility by education officials of whatever race. The principal of Bennett Q Elementary School in Inglewood, California, whose student body is 52% Hispanic and 45% black, raised these children's reading levels from the 3rd percentile to the 50th percentile in just four years. But she was threatened with loss of money because she used phonics instead of the mandated whole-language teaching methods and taught exclusively in English instead of using the bilingual approach required by education authorities. The fact that she was succeeding where others were failing carried no weight with state education officials. Fortunately, it carried enough weight with the parents of her students that they bombarded these officials with protests that caused them to relent and let this principal continue to succeed in her own way, instead of failing in their way. In Houston, Texas, students in Wesley Elementary School, 92% black and 7% Hispanic, were reading several years below grade level before a new principal installed a new curriculum and raised their reading and math scores above the national average. But again, the methods he used were not those favored by the education establishment, which tried to stop him. Fortunately, a new district superintendent, Rod Page, later U.S. Secretary of Education, was more supportive so that the success of this school and these methods continued under a new principal who said bluntly, the teachers' colleges are to blame for so much school failure. Educational success usually provides no protection from the wrath of those who impose their educational dogmas on the schools and will not tolerate seeing those dogmas ignored. High school math teacher Jaime Escalante, whose successes in teaching Mexican-American students was celebrated in the movie Stand and Deliver, was eventually hounded out of Garfield High School in Los Angeles. Yet while he was there, about one-fourth of all Mexican-American students in the entire country who passed advanced placement calculus came from Garfield High School. Documented results are not allowed to override the prevailing educational dogmas, which pervade the schools of education, the teachers' unions, and state and federal education bureaucracies, none of whom pays the price for the failure of these dogmas. Neither do their children, who are typically enrolled in private schools. What they would have to pay a price for would be widespread demonstrations that the methods to which they are committed produce educational results that are grossly inferior to those produced by the methods they oppose. Should such revelations become widely known among parents and voters, this would threaten not only their careers, but also their agendas, which include the use of public schools to promote fashionable beliefs and attitudes, political correctness, rather than to equip students' minds with knowledge and develop their capacity for independent use of logic and evidence. None of this says that there is just one best way of teaching all students. That would be repeating the dogmatic approach of the education establishment. What the record of successful minority schools shows, both in history and among contemporary schools, is that educational achievement is not foredoomed by economic or social circumstances beyond the school grounds, as the education establishment constantly strives to prove. Poverty, broken homes, and unruly environments are not to be ignored, downplayed, or apologized for. But neither are the failings of others proof that the education establishment is doing its job right. Perfect students with perfect parents in a perfect society cannot learn things that they are not being taught, and that includes an increasing number of basic things in our public schools. While successful minority schools do not use any single formula or ideology, they do make sure to teach those basic things that get neglected by more typical or more trendy schools, beginning with reading. Portland Elementary School in Portland, Arkansas, has multiple violations of prevailing educational dogmas and such academic success that it is besieged with requests from parents who want to transfer their students in. Ironically, white students were once transferring out, back in 1970, in response to racial desegregation. Until recent years, declining educational standards were painfully visible in the fact that half the students in the fourth through sixth grades were scoring two or more years below grade level. Then came a new principal with old-fashioned ideas about education who began to get old-fashioned results. 
Now 100% of the students are reading at grade level or higher, and a majority of the students are above the national average on both reading and math tests. One of these old-fashioned ideas is called directed instruction, what used to be called just plain teaching, as distinguished from the more trendy notion that teachers are to be facilitators on the sidelines, letting students discover and create knowledge themselves. In Portland Elementary, directed instruction has proven to be especially effective with at-risk students. In other words, kids who have nobody to teach them at home improve greatly when there is somebody to teach them at school, instead of using them as guinea pigs for experiments. Not satisfied with violating educational dogma by plain old teaching, Principal Ernest Smith also groups students by ability and gives them tests every 10 lessons or about every 7 or 8 days, all of which is taboo in educational establishment circles. So successful has this approach turned out to be that whites have been transferring back in and now constitute a majority of the students. Another successful minority school, 99% black, with 80% of its students coming from low-income families, is Cascade Elementary School in Atlanta. Although its demographics would be considered to be a formula for automatic failure by those in the education establishment, in fact, these students have scored at the 74th percentile on reading tests and at the 83rd percentile on math tests. Principal Alfonso L. Jesse is so old-fashioned that he will not tolerate misbehavior. Jesse explains to parents at the beginning of the year that if their children misbehave in school, they will be personally escorted to the parents' place of work. Not surprisingly, Cascade has almost no discipline problems. Such a principal might well be accused of stereotyping or racism by civil rights groups, community activists, or white liberals, if you were not black. Like other schools for minority children, the Marva Collins Preparatory School in Chicago has its founder's no-nonsense back-to-basics curriculum that is centered on phonics and memorization for the younger students and higher-level reasoning and literary analysis for the older ones. It also features weekly tests in all subjects every Friday. It is not hard to understand why Marva Collins was unpopular with education authorities when she taught in the public schools and had to go set up her own private school in order to teach the way that she wanted to. Chicago public schools were declared to be the worst in the nation back in the 1980s by William J. Bennett, then U.S. Secretary of Education. Despite some improvements, even as late as 1996, half of all the children in the Chicago schools were performing below grade level in four-fifths of the city schools. Yet even here, there has been an exception. Using methods that are an exception to the prevailing educational dogmas, children in Earhart Elementary School in Chicago's Southside Ghetto score at the 70th percentile in reading and the 80th percentile in math. 99% of these children are black, and more than four-fifths of them qualify for the free lunch or reduced-price lunch program. Taking advantage of a 1988 law that allowed individual schools more leeway to escape rigid educational dogmas, a new principal began teaching reading based on phonics and memorization of sight words, devoting an hour and a half each morning exclusively to reading. During this reading period, all physical education, music, art, and library activities were brought to a halt so that the entire support staff could help the children with their reading. The school taught things like grammar and composition, which are considered passé in educational circles. But it achieved success, which is also passé, in too many public schools today. The Kip Academy in Houston, Texas its name derived from the Knowledge is Power program, has achieved such success on both math and reading tests that it has spawned a spin-off with the same name in the Bronx. The first KIPP school began with a campus that consisted of 12 trailers parked near a baseball field at Houston Baptist University. Like many other successful schools for low-income minority students, its emphasis is on work. If you're off the bus, you're working said its principal and co-founder, Michael Feinberg. KIPP students spend 67% more time in the classroom than the average public school student. Each morning, students receive a worksheet of math, logic, and word problems for them to solve in the free minutes that appear throughout the day. KIPP co-founders Michael Feinberg and David Levin, who later headed the Bronx School of the same name, 
did not begin with theories, such as teachers' colleges do. Instead, they studied what worked in various schools around the country and made that the basis for their program. Not only is this the opposite of the approach used by education experts, so is the KIPP rejection of any single magic formula for teaching. KIPP teachers are free to teach as they see fit, so long as they get results. These teachers also visit parents in their homes to explain what they are doing and what the parents need to do. And they carry cell phones with toll-free numbers so that they can be reached after school hours. They mean business. Many other successful minority schools, too numerous to mention, are operating in various communities around the country. Twenty-one of them were studied by the Heritage Foundation under its No Excuses program. To be eligible for this program, a school must score at or above the 65th percentile on national achievement tests, and 75% of their students must qualify for the subsidized or free lunch program. Most schools where such a high percentage of students come from homes with low enough incomes to qualify for this lunch program score below the 35th percentile. Yet the 21 schools that met the No Excuses program criteria and whose results were published were by no means the only such schools just the ones that happened to be found in the survey that was conducted. What are the secrets of such successful schools? The biggest secret is that there are no secrets, unless work is a secret. Work seems to be the only four-letter word that cannot be used in public today. Aside from work and discipline, the various successful schools for minority children have had little in common with one another and even less in common with the fashionable educational theories of our times. Some of these schools have been public, some private. Some have been secular, and some have been religious. Dunbar High School had an all-black teaching staff, but St. Augustine in New Orleans began with an all-white teaching staff. Some of these schools were housed in old, run-down buildings, and others in new, modern facilities. Some of their principals were finely attuned to the social and political nuances, while others were blunt people who could not have cared less about such things and would have failed public relations one. 